All right, everyone, thanks for your time today. My name is Scott Moore, and I'm a senior technical account manager for Ingram Micro, supporting HPE Hybrid IT. At the end of the last webinar I did on ProLiant Gen 11, there was a pop-up survey and a follow-up survey that was sent out where a lot of attendees expressed interest in knowing more about the Generation 11 improvements and specific information on product positioning. So I put this presentation together. Before we get started, uh, I did mention before, I will send out a copy of the presentation afterwards, as well as a link to a recording of the session after we're done. So if you see something that's particularly interesting, you don't need to rush to screen capture it. You'll have your very own copy uh, shortly after we are done. Also, this training came out of feedback that was received after our last session, as I mentioned. So please take the time to fill out any survey you may receive about this session after we are done. We actually do read and appreciate the feedback and we'll be happy to produce more trainings around topics that you'd be interested in hearing more about. So here's what I plan on covering today. I wanna to begin by taking a high level look at the difference between Gen 10, Gen 10 Plus and Gen 11. And then we'll delve a little bit deeper into all of the specific components that uh, kind of changed between those families. From there, I'll talk a little bit about applications, positioning, sizing, verticals and workloads to kind of level set before delving into those topics a little deeper as we talk about server positioning. I'll talk about positioning of the new Gen 11 non-DL servers first because there's only a few of them. Then we'll go on and address the intended positioning of the DL series rack mount Gen 11 servers. Talk a little bit about some common workloads and their typical features, and then we'll kind of zoom out a bit and we'll look at guidelines for positioning Gen 10, Gen 10 Plus, and Gen 11 together. Then we'll wrap up by talking a little bit about the new HPE BTO acceleration promo and have a short review of Ingram's pre-sales configuration resources. So many HP servers are currently available in a generation 10, a generation 10 plus, and a generation 11 version, with all three expected to remain available for most of 2023. This slide outlines the differences between those three versions. If you want a, a one pager to kind of use for reference, this is it. This slide outlines uh, the differences, and I will say that the HPE quick specs do have separate documents for each server in the Gen 10, Gen 10 Plus, and Gen 11 families. So it's fairly easy to find specific uh, information on the family that best, sits your customer, best suits your customer's needs for uh, any particular application. Uh, keep in mind that for a lot of low-level applications, if you're looking at things like file servers, edge security, gateways, domain controllers, things like that, the Gen 10 and the Gen 10 Plus are still perfectly valid solutions. Um, the benefits of moving to a Gen 11, things like increased memory speed, increased PCIe bus bandwidth, uh, and the number of increased cores available on the processor, those things don't necessarily contribute to uh, significantly anyway to the performance of something like a file server, a gateway, a domain controller. Uh, so there's still plenty of applications out there where you can make do with a Gen 10 or a Gen 10 plus due to the application's low requirements in a lot of those cases. So as I mentioned, this is kind of a one page of, of everything. Um, the features in red are what changed from generation to generation. But what I do wanna do is I'll go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So PCIe standards. PCIe Generation 3 has been around for a while, and it was pretty much the standard that Gen 8, Gen 9, and Gen 10 were all built off of. With PCIe Generation 3, you had 985 megabytes per second was the maximum speed you could get across a single PCIe lane. That means you could do, technically, 8 billion transformations per lane on PCIe 3.0. So 
eight giga transactions per second per lane. We hopped up to PCI 4.0 on the Gen 10 Plus, and then quickly hopped again up to PCIe 5.0 on Gen 11. And in both of those transitions, the speed or the bandwidth is probably a better term to describe it by, doubled. So we went from 985 megabytes per second to 1.97 gigabytes per second to 3.94 gigabytes per second of maximum throughput per lane, which means we went from 8 billion transactions, 8 giga transactions per second per lane to 16 billion transactions per second per lane to now 32 billion transactions capable per second per PCIe lane. So the PCIe bus that we connect all our peripherals to is now providing us with a ton of more bandwidth than we had available just a few years ago. The easy way to remember this, the Gen 10 Plus is double the speed of Gen 10. The Gen 11 is double the speed of the Gen 10 Plus when it comes to PCIe. BLOMS and OCP. BLOMS stood for Flexible LAN on Motherboard, and OCP stands for Open Compute Project. These were essentially small form factor expansion um, configurations that were added to the server. They take up generally less space than a PCIe card, and so HPE standardized on using the FLOM many years back for the network interface cards. Um, because it's kind of the one PCIe peripheral that every server is going to need. Every server needs to collect, connect to a network. So HPE came out with the FLOM small form factor kind of format for their onboard NIC cards. And those were used on the Gen 9s and the Gen 10 servers. The FLOM is HPE proprietary. There aren't third parties who make FLOM NICs for HPE. However, the Open Compute Project which is a organization that is responsible for the creation and the promotion of open standards for server compute, came out with a similar form factor to do a similar purpose. Uh, the Open Compute Project 3.0 OCP slot is essentially for adding additional peripherals to a server in a form factor that's smaller than a standard PCIe card. HPE has made the decision to go from the proprietary FLOM format to the OCP 3.0 format with the Gen 10 Plus and Gen 11 servers. Now, as far as advantages for doing so, there really isn't a technical advantage to doing so. It's that the OCP is an industry standard. So HPE decided um, with the direction of wanting to become more compatible with open standards, they would do away with the proprietary FLOM and go with the OCP slot instead. HPE does offer OCP 3.0 NICs, so do other manufacturers because OCP 3.0 is an open standard. Any manufacturer's OCP 3.0 NIC card will work in an HPE Gen 11 or Gen 10 Plus server. Drive carriers. Drive carriers have changed a bit over the generations, and there are some generations where you can use um, different drive carriers depending on the cages you get for your server. The smart carrier, which we have a couple of pictures of on the left side of the screen here, um, these are the ones that if you remember the, the spinning activity ring on the handle, there was a little circle on the handle and you could watch the lights go around in a circle to indicate that drive was active and doing something. And it had the, the standard port wine, which appears purple to me, but HP calls it port wine, that little button on the right uh, that you would push to release the handle to remove the drive. The smart carriers were used on the generation 8, 9, and 10. HPE recently switched over to the basic carrier, slightly different carrier, same idea. I still want a, uh, a hot pluggable drive and that's what the basic carrier gives me. The uh, little spinning activity ring is gone. Um, and instead of that wide purple button, I've got just a kind of a thin purple stripe on a black button for the basic carrier. That's an easy way to visually distinguish them anyway. Um, and the basic carriers were available primarily on the Gen 10 Plus 
or Gen 11 servers. Although that is something that can vary, like I said, depending on the drive cages and the array controllers you add to your server. Now, even though that activity ring went away from the smart carriers, I do want to point out that the same uh, the same kind of indicators that you had on the smart carrier are available on the basic carrier and vice versa. So even though they've rearranged them a little bit, both carriers provide information on uh, location ID, activity, failure, and drive status. So that hasn't changed. If you look at, uh, if you've gone through the quick specs for any of the HPE servers and you look at all the different drive capacities they have available, and sometimes you'll see SC or BC listed in the description of the drive, that's referring to smart carrier or basic carrier. Processors, uh, in the generation 10, and this specifically says DL300 series, just because that was the main product line in each of these generations that I'm referring to, um, but it's true for some of the MLs as well. The original Gen 10 servers, the Intel ones, used the first and second generation scalable Xeon processors, the first generation known as the Skylake and having a one in the second digit of the four digit number and the second generation known as Cascade Lake, and those had a two in the second digit of the number. So you may see like an Intel 5110 or an Intel 5214. Uh, that tells you it's a first or second generation by that second digit in the name. The AMD versions were the uh, Epic 7002 series, or what uh, they called internally the Rome processors, for the generation 10. Um, when HPE went to the Gen 10 Plus, that was kind of motivated by Intel coming out with their third generation of processors. And again, I have the differences here kind of in red to highlight them as they change from generation to generation. So the third generation of Intel scalable processors, the Ice Lake processors, could go up to 40 cores, where the first and second generation could only go up to 28. The AMD Epic processors in Gen 10 Plus did not change. They were still based on the ROM processors, the same that were used in the Gen 10. The reason there is because the AMD Epic 7002 ROM processors could go up to 64 cores. So the core capacity for the AMD Epics was larger than the Intel maximum number of cores for generations one, two, and three of those Intel processors. So there wasn't any need to change the AMD Gen 10 Plus processor because we could get significant performance out of those same Epic 7002 ROM processors due to the high number of cores. When Gen 11 came out, it was motivated by the fact that both manufacturers, AMD and Intel, were kind of... Uh, on the cusp of releasing new families of processors. So Intel announced their fourth generation scalable Xeon processors, what they called internally Sapphire Rapids. The Sapphire Rapids processors could go up to 56 cores per processor. Shortly before those were released, AMD released their Epic 9004 series, uh, internally known as Genoa processors. And the Genoa processors could go up to 96 cores on a single chip. So it used to be in the old days, when you bought a processor, the only thing you really cared about was the gigahertz or megahertz speed, if you go back far enough, of the processor itself. And that told you how fast the processor was gonna perform. Now that pretty much multiple cores per processor has become a standard, the speed is not that important anymore. If I have 96 cores, I essentially have 96 individual processors all packaged within one computer chip, one CPU chip. Uh, similarly, in the Intel world, if I got the high-end Sapphire Rapids chip, I have 56 computational cores all within one processor package. If I had a dual Intel Sapphire Rapids system, like a DL380 that holds two processors, I'm looking at 112 processor cores on a single two CPU system. So the gigahertz speed, although it's a good relative rating compared to the other processors, it's not so important anymore compared to the number of processing cores that you actually have available on the processor. 
Um, besides the processors and the number of cores, I also want to point out the PCIe lane design going to the processor. The first and second generation Intel scalable Xeons had 48 PCIe lanes going directly to the processor. And those PCIe lanes go to things like your NIC, your PCIe slots, um, onboard RAID controller, uh, essentially the peripherals of the system. When Intel went from the first and second generation scalable Xeons to the third generation, they uh, dropped it to 40 core, um, I'm sorry, uh, they brought it up to 64 lanes per processor, so a little bit of a bump there. When they went up to the fourth generation, what we currently have on Gen 11, there's actually 112 PCIe lanes tied directly to the processor. So those are lanes for things like, as I mentioned before, any PCIe peripherals, NICs, array controllers. Another thing that PCIe lanes connected to the processor are, are becoming more and more useful with our NVMe. NVMe is a storage technology that connects directly to the processor. It's not intended to go through an intermediary like old SCSI and SAS and SATA drives had it could be connected to a controller, which it was then connected to the PCIe bus. NVMe drives, I can put directly on the bus that goes to the processor. And that's why NVMe drives are so fast. So the Gen 11, I have 120, 112 PCIe lanes going back to my Intel processors. On the Epic Genoa processors, I have 128 PCIe lanes going back to the processor. And actually, AMD has been at 128 PCIe lanes to the processor for a while now. You can see back to the Gen 10 Plus and the Gen 10, that was true for their Epic 7002 Rome series processors as well. DDR4 versus DDR5. Uh, DDR4 uh, is used on the Gen 10 and the Gen 10 Plus servers. And DDR5 is the new memory technology used on the Gen 11. And this is kind of a, uh, a mixed bag a little bit, to be honest. Um, the transfer rate and the speed, as you can see on the first two lines, are essentially doubled. Uh, so we went from... Um, 2666, 2933, or 3200 mega transaction, transactions per second, up to 4800 mega transactions per second. So roughly 50% faster. If you look at the maximum speed, which is just another way of looking at transfer rate, we went from anywhere from 21.3 to 25.6 gigabytes per second, up to 38.4 gigabytes per second with DDR5. So again, 50% faster at a minimum. 50% faster. Now, usually when you look at memory, if you look at anything other than capacity, you might look at the speed. So you might look at, oh, 3,200 mega transactions versus 4,800 mega transactions. Oh, the 4,800 should be faster. And normally that would be true. However, just like with, if you remember hard drive technology, it wasn't so much the, the type of the interface. It was also uh, how fast it spun. It was the latency, things like that. Let's talk about latency when it relates to DDR4 and DDR5. The column address select latency, which was roughly in the range of 19 to 26 on the Gen 10 and Gen 10 Plus, is now 40 or 46 on the DDR5. And lower is better when we're talking about latency. The row address select to column address select delay, which was also 19 to 22 range on the Gen 10 and Gen 10 Plus, is now 39 on the DDR5 memory. And the row address select pre-charge was 19 to 22 on the DDR4 products, but it's currently 39 on the DDR5 products. So what does that difference mean? That tells us that the actual refresh done to the memory on the memory chips themselves takes a little bit longer. Now, by longer, that's a relative term. By longer, I mean there's more going on to do the refreshes on the DDR5 chip than there were on the DDR4 chip. So they're not performing. The latency is not 50% less 
like you would expect it to be since the transfer rate and the speed are 50% greater. Um, the end result of having a faster overall memory system that takes longer to refresh and has higher latency is that right now, DDR4 and DDR5 performance relatively close to one another. So there's not a huge jump in the memory performance at this time. However, in the days of DDR4, it took us a while to get those latencies down to the 19 to 22 range. Now, originally when DDR4 came out, the latencies were quite a bit higher. So you can expect that's going to happen with latencies on the DDR5 chips as well. That latency is related specifically to the memory chips, not the memory system on board the motherboard. So theoretically, when faster memory chips come out, it's just a matter of dropping in faster memory chips and you'll see the additional performance that's available through DDR5. It's not like you'd have to change out the entire motherboard and go to different memory controllers and things like that. The memory controllers can, uh, the memory controllers can handle it the memory modules themselves have to be built with lower latencies, and those will come over time. So if you were all excited about the jump from DDR4 to DDR5, I'm sorry to be the person to break bad news to you. As far as power supplies, um, HPE has used the flexible slot power supplies for quite a while, Gen 10, Gen 10 Plus, Gen 11. There is a limit, there is a hard limit um, based on the internal components of the motherboard on the Gen 10 and the Gen 10 Plus, and they cannot use higher than a 1600 watt power supply. So on the, uh, the different color bands here, uh, if you didn't notice the key at the bottom, the, the ones in yellow are uh, low voltage and high voltage alternating current. The ones in blue are high voltage only alternating current and at the very bottom in the pink or salmon or orange or however that appears to you uh, those are dc power supplies and hpe does have both 94 percent and 96 94 and 96 percent efficient power supplies the platinums are considered 94 percent the titaniums are considered 96 percent efficient but you had a hard limit on the gen 10 and gen 10 plus of 1600 watts that could quickly get consumed if you were doing things like a lot of NVMe or GPU cards, especially. With the Gen 11 Plus, they've released two new power supplies that will go between 1800 to 2200 watts. Those would physically fit in a Gen 10 or Gen 10 Plus, but they will not work. They will not work at anything above 1600 watts because that's the maximum that the system can actually handle. So if you're thinking, oh, I can take these new 1800 to 2200 watt power supplies and drop them into my Gen 10 or Gen 10 Plus and stick in a few more NVMe drives or maybe an extra GPU, that's not gonna happen. It's not gonna work, sorry. Um, the 1800 to 2200, um, that is depending on the voltage. So if you're running at 208 volts, you'll get 1800 watts out of it. If you're running at 240 volts, you'll get 2200 watts out of it. So like I mentioned before, if you have a need for multiple GPU cards, high-end GPU cards, or maybe you wanna do a bunch of NVMe, you might wanna consider using those uh, higher wattage power supplies. Now you notice those are only available in the two, and what I have listed as 220 volt AC, but essentially in high voltage configurations. They're not available in low voltage configurations. And that's because low voltage maxes out at 120 watts. And a regular low voltage outlet in the US or Canada or Japan is a 15 amp outlet. So 120 volts times 15 amps is gonna give you something below 2200 watts. So unfortunately, there's no way to get that much wattage out of a, a low voltage line. ILO 6 is now available on the Gen 11s as well. And there were a few improvements done to ILO 6. To be perfectly honest, probably not a lot of stuff that you might notice if you use ILO like most people do. And it just kind of, I want alerts 
and I want to know when something's going to fail. And I want to be able to see all my servers and make sure everything's running fine and my fans aren't failing or anything like that. You might not notice uh, or care about these benefits. Um, most of them pertain to the implementation, actually pretty much all of them, uh, pertain to the implementation of additional DMTF standards for the support of open management. DMTF stands for Distributed Management Task Force, and it's an open standards organization creating generic open standards for server management. Adding additional DMTF functionality is kind of along the same lines as HPE transitioning from the FLOM to the OCP slots. It just allows more industry standard functionality to be used on the ProLiant servers. So the new DMTF features added to the ILO 6 include uh, implementing SPDM, which is security protocol and data model uh, level security, Redfish certificate manager to enhance security, and platform level data model or PLDM for Redfish, which allows downstream drive and option firmware updates. For those that frequently add uh, ILO Advanced Pack or OneView on top of their servers, it's worth mentioning that both of those optional software packages work with both ILO 5 and ILO 6, and there are no differences in part numbers based on the ILO version. So if you've been buying the specific part number for everything that has ILO 5 on it, that same part number will work for everything that has ILO 6 on it. Uh, finally, as far as the Gen 11 improvements go, liquid cooling as opposed to traditional air cooling is now available for, for some of the Gen 11 servers. Liquid cooling provides better overall cooling for the increased heat that's generated by the increasing CPU voltage requirements that we have to deal with now. HPE offers closed loop liquid cooling, which is self-contained cooling, as well as direct liquid cooling, which is something that's continually fed from a water source or liquid source, depending on the model. Closed loop liquid cooling solutions are available on the DL325, DL360, and DL560 Gen 11 servers, and typically involve a special fan and a special heat sink as additional parts. Direct liquid cooling options are available for the DL360, DL365, DL380, and DL385 Gen 11 servers. The next few slides specifically address direct liquid cooling on the DL385 Gen 11. And I picked this just because I want to provide an example of how direct liquid cooling works in one specific family and show the considerations that kind of need to be taken into account if you're going to do liquid cooling. Now on this slide, this is demonstrating your options for um, direct liquid cooling cold plate modules and liquid loops, which are the internal components that get mounted in the DL385. Uh, these are parts A and B signified by the purple circles. There's a couple different options depending on how you want to configure it. Um, there's two different cold plate modules and liquid loop kits for the 3D5, as I said, depending on how you want to mount them and uh, how you want to configure your chassis because the cooling is passed out through different, uh, different sections of the back of the server, depending on what you choose. Part A is the set of internal components necessary when you're running the cooling pipes near the or through the NS204i-U cage in the back. So if you're not using the NS204iU and you want liquid cooling, you can run your pipes out to that same cage. Part B on here is a set of internal components necessary when running the cooling pipes through the secondary PCIe cage. Then there's also two sets of external tubing. Part C is a set of 55 centimeter long external tubes with quick disconnect mechanisms for connecting either the eight small form factor, large form factor, or EDSFF uh, servers to the liquid source. Part D on here is a set of 45 centimeter long external tubes with the quick disconnect mechanisms for connecting to either the 48 small form factor or GPU based servers. So on this slide, on this server, if you want to do direct liquid cooling, you would choose either A or B, and then also choose C or D. In addition to selecting that cold plate and quick disconnect pipe or hose kit for the server, 
You also have to make sure you have the correct rack that will support direct liquid cooling because you need to make sure you have room in there to run the pipes around. These would be the Enterprise G2 racks that have the larger footprint, the 800 millimeter by 1200 millimeter, as opposed to the, the older standard 600 millimeter by 1075 millimeter. The 1200 millimeter adds some extra depth to the rack. The 800 millimeter gives you extra room on both sides. So there's extra room between the panels and the actual frame of the rack. And on this screen, it's hard to see, but like I said, you'll get a copy of the presentation. Uh, it does give an example of where you can find the components when you're trying to build a liquid cooled system in OCA. So if you go under processor, uh, under heatsink kit, and then also go under power and cooling, you'll find the components that you need to add for direct liquid cooling. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here, but before I do, uh, I'm just gonna take a peek over at the Q&A box and see what we've had there. Um, there's a note here, I missed the first session. Would it be beneficial to view that one? And if so, can I get a link to that recording? Yes, you can get a link to that recording. Uh, Steve, I will send you a copy of that in a separate email, either later today or tomorrow. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily beneficial in order to take this information in. Uh, it, a lot of it was additional information. I did touch on these topics a little bit, uh, but I wouldn't say that's uh, required viewing before attending this webinar. Um, and someone else also asked, what was the reasoning behind the carrier change? It's very confusing to customers. Uh, with this one, I will answer the second part as well first. Yes, it is. It's terribly confusing, not only to customers, but to uh, everybody else as well. Uh, there was a reason for it, believe it or not. It wasn't just, we want to be cruel to our users. Um, the basic carrier, which came out after the smart carrier, the design was implemented so that they could use it not only for SAS and SATA drives um, and hard drives or SSDs, but that they could also use those for uh, NVMe interfaces. So U.2 and U.3 interfaces are easier to implement with the basic carrier layout and the basic carrier style drive, um, I was gonna say drive cage, uh, drive back planes. Uh, so there was some, there was a reason for it. Now, NVMe is still kind of growing and increasing in popularity. So a lot of customers are perfectly fine just using SSDs. And uh, when they do so, they don't care that, you know, Basic carriers are easier for people using NVMe. Um, so there isn't a lot of, there wasn't a lot of concern from most customers, I would say. Uh, customers were happy just using SSDs for the most part. They had abandoned hard drives. NVMe is still kind of uh, emerging as a technology. But to kind of future-proof um, the ability to add NVMe to these servers in the future, HPE switched over to the basic carriers for the newer, the newer servers. And you sometimes you'll even see um, like the basic carrier drive cages and back planes listed as tri-mode, which means hard drive flash and NVMe or SAS SATA, uh, SAS SATA and the NVMe. Uh, and so that was, the, that was the engineering reason behind it. But yes, every time, they change drive cages. I, I feel your pain. I absolutely feel your pain on that. Um, so those are the only two questions in there now. Switching back, um, I'm gonna talk about product positioning a little bit. So to start off, I wanna define a few terms. So we're all kind of on the same page. And this is a good chunk of this may seem obvious to a lot of folks. It may also be that kind of thing that, yeah, it's obvious, but until somebody said it, I never really thought about it. Uh, there are, there's a bit of confusion out there, I will say, among some resellers as to what we actually mean by positioning. So I'm going to go through a few de definitions just so we're all working from a consistent set of definitions. So an application is a general use for a server. You can say it's, it's an AI server, it's an analytics server, it's a database server, it's a file server. It's a general use. It's not talking much about, if I'm talking about an application, I'm not necessarily talking about my specific implementation of it. I'm just saying what that server is going to be used for. Positioning. 
Positioning is finding a solution that fits a general application. So for example, this server will hold a lot of storage for large databases. I didn't say anything about my specific use case. I didn't say how big my database was, but in general, if I have large databases, this server holds a lot of storage. So if I'm concerned about large databases, I might wanna look at a server that can hold a lot of storage. Doesn't get into specifics about what my actual need is, but if I know you wanna do databases, I can position servers for specific applications, knowing what those applications generally use. Sizing, sizing is finding a solution that fits a specific workload. So sizing is different from positioning because we're not talking about general applications, we're talking about specific workloads where a general application might be, hey, this server holds a lot of data for large databases. A specific workload might be, this server has 24 drive bays, which is definitely gonna be enough to give you room for that 40 terabyte RAID 6 using the two terabyte drives. It'll also give you room for an online spare. And then, you know, you also said you want a dual three gigahertz CPUs. We can do that in here, it's a dual CPU system. That's pretty specific. And the sizing is done for a specific workload, where again, positioning is kind of a general application. Verticals. Verticals are common customer marketing classifications that frequently share similar sets of specific applications. So if you talk about bank, if you're talking about banking, for example, um, banking uses a lot of analytics applications, clustering applications, databases, security, those are all important in banking. Uh, in education, right now, there's a lot of use for VDI in education, as well as just straight file servers, some security. If you're looking at manufacturing, databases are popular in manufacturing, test development environments are popular in manufacturing. Um, video streaming has come into manufacturing quite a bit, not only for security, but for quality control and things like that. Uh, so if you're talking about a vertical, there's usually several applications that are commonly found in that vertical. And workloads. Workloads are requirements for a specific application. If you're looking at multiple workloads, it's probably because you're looking at for something that's going to go into a specific vertical. So it's the information you need to properly size a solution. And the example here is, hey, we have 10 terabytes of shared files on top of 60 virtual desktops, each with four terabytes of storage. Currently using two three gigahertz CPU cores and eight gig of RAM per virtual desktop. Everything's running on a one gig ethernet network and we're expecting about 25% annual growth for each of the next five years that we want to have this solution deployed for. That specific information. So that's the kind of stuff that you want when you're sizing a server, not necessarily what you need when you're just positioning a server. Uh, positioning a server is usually enough to <laughs> Uh, if your customer is not sure what they need yet as far as requirements, positioning a server might be beneficial because they can look at the features of what you position and they can figure out, hey, is that gonna work for us? Is that not gonna work for us? Or maybe that works in for some requirements, but in other cases, I need something different. So positioning kind of gets you that first step towards, so you're trying to do X in a general sense, let me tell you the kind of features servers have that would accommodate that. And then from there, you kind of drill down, they refine their workload a little bit better to you. You can refine your positioning a little bit better and make it, turn it into sizing for them, for your end user. So specifically Gen 11 positioning. And right now I'm gonna talk about everything but the DL300 series, just because there's only a few of them there. Uh, the ML110 and the ML350 are both tower servers. They're both Intel-based. They're both perfect for small, medium business environments where um, maybe you need a small file server, small database, something like that. The big difference between the ML110 and the ML350 is the ML350 is dual processor capable where the ML110 only supports a single processor. So again, if it's something like eh, file servers, I need to run one specialty app, I need a gateway, something to put my firewall on, the 110 might be fine. 
if it's something like, say, a dentist office where I have a dentist in the back who's looking at uh, patient x-rays pretty regularly, and I have a receptionist in the front who's also accessing the same database, but she's pulling information like uh, appointment times and addresses and billing amounts and things like that. Maybe for a database, it might be a little bit more processor intensive. That's something I might want to use an ML354 over a 110. The RL300 is really kind of its, uh, its own special kid. Uh, it uses a single Ampere-based CPU, uh, which is, uses the, um, I forget the name of the processor now. I can't believe I forgot the name of the processor, uh, or the core, I should say. The processor itself is an Ampere, um, but it's a multi-core processor, single processor. This is a dense one u server intended specifically for scale out and cloud native applications web services, content delivery, things like that. It is intended to be, if you're gonna put an operating system on, not use it um, just for cloud, it is a Linux box. This isn't something you would install Windows on straight away, unless you are gonna use Windows on top, of a, um, you know, on top of a virtual machine, a cloud virtual machine or something like that. But for those people who want to do a, um, a cloud-based platform and maybe flex between uh, in the cloud and on-prem. You can run cloud-based applications on this in Linux. That's really what the RL300 is kind of based for. The DL560 Gen 11 just recently came out. This is four Intel CPUs in a single box. It is 2U rack mount. So for those that do need a ton of compute power in a single box, this is your go-to Gen 11 server. Uh, now, remember, we did talk about the number of cores per processor increasing as Intel has moved from generation one, two to three to four. So in a lot of cases, customers can get the level of pure compute they need just from increasing the number of cores in their processor. But for those really high end, I need to deploy a ton of virtual servers or virtual desktops. I need to do some ridiculously large database with uh, tons of people accessing it, like an e-commerce site or something like that, you might want four processors worth of compute working on that. So that's what the 560 is really kind of positioned for. And the Synergy 480, the Synergy 480 is the, uh, the Gen 11 is the new version of HPE's Blade Server. This is really out there for customers that are currently using the composable infrastructure and they want to have uh, kind of continue to add more compute and faster resources based on uh, their already existing investment in Synergy technology. So no change required to the frames or anything like that. You can now get Gen 11 SY480 uh, dual CPU capable Synergy uh, blade servers for your Synergy 12,000 chassis. So this slide goes over all those other DL300 series Gen 11s. And I did show this in the last presentation as well, and I kind of went over it quickly. I'll spend a little bit more time going over it here. This is intended to kind of give you some positioning and ideas on where each of the DL300 series Gen 11 rack mount server families are best positioned. Uh, the AMD servers are across the top, the Intel servers are across the bottom. On the far left, we have the 1U single processor, cost-optimized Intel DL320 and the AMD DL325. These are the low-cost DL300 series servers that each support a single processor. And each has a low number of drive bays and PCI slots because they are so thin, so dense. So this is for folks who need a, a minimal server for simple functions. Um, the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, there are people who do use the DL320 and DL325 in high-end clusters with the idea that if I'm running 300 of these in a, a Linux cluster, if one of them dies, I just pull it out and I put a whole new one in its place. Uh, so there is, although it's intended to be kind of uh, an entry-level low-end rack mount server, there is a high-end application for some of those DL320s and 325s as well. For those who like that kind of low expandability, you don't need a lot of drive base, you don't need a lot of PCIe cards, uh, and you like the density of the DL320 and DL325, but you need a little bit more 
uh, compute ability, specifically if you're doing like VDI or databases, uh, or if you're doing like an external SAN or NAS, so you don't need the drive bays inside, so you'd like to keep the compute as dense as possible. That's why we've got the DL360 and the DL365, which are listed as the density optimized platforms here. So similar to the 320 and 325, but dual process are capable. The AMD based 2U DL345, which is listed here as storage optimized. It offers a ton of space because it's 2U, so you can get up to 24 drive bays in it. It's also larger than any of the servers we talked about so far, so you do have room for a bunch of PCIe cards in it as well. Um, but it is a single processor system. The reason there is a DL345 and there isn't a DL340, like typically the Intel uh, server ends in zero, the AMD server ends in five and the rest of the name is the same. The reason there's a DL345 and there isn't a DL340 is going back to that processor conversation we had. Remember that the AMD CPUs can now go up to 96 cores per processor. Uh, which is officially at the ridiculously high level. So in theory, some of the things you might have considered buying a DL380 or a DL385 for, you can get away and save a little money and go with a DL345, which is only a single CPU capable computer. But if I can get 96 cores on a single processor, that's the equivalent of running dual processors, each with 48 cores. So why not? It's it's a, a viable option for a lot of folks. The DL380, which if you're familiar with HP servers at all, that's probably the one you know best, uh, is listed here as a multi-workload optimized server, which is just a nice way of saying this is really HPE's kind of go-to for everything. It is dual processor capable, you can do up to 24 drive bays uh, and even a couple more in the back if you really wanted to. Um, and a decent number of PCIe expansion cards. So as far as positioning goes, DL380 can fit pretty much most applications. One or more DL380s will work fine. Now there are situations that you may say, well, I don't need that much storage. I don't need that many PCIe slots. Well, then maybe you can drop down to like a DL360 or a 365, or if you don't need that much compute, even down to a 320 or a 325. But the 380 is probably a good place to start if you're looking for uh, to position the right server for any kind of workload. You can start with the 380 and say, okay, is this overkill for drive bays? Is this too much compute or not enough compute? And you can kind of go from there. The DL385, which is kind of the AMD version of the DL380, uh, and also a brand new server called the DL380A. These are both kind of um, modified versions of the DL380, if you will, are based on the DL380. The DL385 is the dual AMD processor version. Again, it's 2U, so decent amount of storage, decent amount of PCIe slots. So if you need that expandability internally, either for storage or PCIe devices, 385 or the 380 might be a way to go. The 380A is intended for uh, use with GPU. Both the 385 and the 380A have increased capacity for GPUs. You can do up to uh, eight single wide GPUs in the DL380A, or you can do up to four dual wide GPUs in the DL380A. So for those customers who need a ton of compute, but don't necessarily need processor compute, if you need GPUs for applications such as artificial intelligence, either training or inference, or large VDI deployments, the DL380A or the DL385 might be a good server to position based on the number of GPUs you can do in there. Dennis Kidney is my personal hero. 
uh, just dropped into the chat the word arm. Thank you, Dennis. That was the word that was escaping me when I was talking about the RL 300s. The uh, Ampere processors used in the RL 300s. Matter of fact, I'm going to hop back there just for a second, just for the sake of completeness. Those RL 300 processors, those Ampere processors, the individual cores are essentially ARM processors. So if you've heard of ARM processors, the Ampere processor is essentially made up of a bunch of ARM processors. Each core within the Ampere processor is an ARM processor. Now, if you're a Linux person, um, you're probably familiar with running Linux on ARM processors because a lot of people do it uh, for a lot of um, single application servers, specially purpose servers, things like that. So it's not even like, although this is a new platform for HPE, um, the ARM processor has a long history with Linux. So this box is kind of something that almost came out of uh, necessity because people have been running Linux on ARM processors for quite a while. So now having a multi ARM core based processor just seem like a, a good fit. And it's a perfect fit for things like cloud applications, as I mentioned before. Thank you for that, Dennis. All right, hopping forward a little bit. We talked about these servers. We talked about general positioning based on what I need for process and compute, what I need for drive bays. If I need a lot of drives, I probably want to go with a 2U server. If I want to go with external storage on a NAS or SAN and maybe just boot from the server. Those one use servers, the 320, 325, 360, 365, those might be good fits if I don't need a lot of PCIe expansion with those servers. So let's switch a little bit and talk about workloads. So when it comes to Gen 11, these are kind of the, the lead with solutions to start customer conversations around specific use cases. This is not meant to imply that end users can't use any server they want for any of these applications. It's just intended to provide guidance for a workload mapping and positioning discussion based on the product's features. The workload characteristics demonstrated with server subsystems generally benefit the workload most, the ones listed here. So you see like under hybrid cloud, hybrid cloud, you probably want more memory, more storage, processor and IO or network are probably secondary to memory or storage. And these, as I mentioned before, and I'll probably say several more times, these are general considerations. So these are going to be, your actual workload is gonna be determined by what your customer actually needs. But if you're kind of looking for a ballpark, where do I even begin? We talked about where, how you can position servers based on their physical features. This would give you some idea where those features should lie if they can give you an idea of what applications they're trying to do. So hybrid cloud containers, VDI, data solutions, compute for AI. Once you kind of know the workload characteristics, you can then determine which servers best meet the needs of the workload by mapping the, subs the subsystem score against the available resources for each server. So for, exa uh, for example, if a, take a workload like transcoding or visualization, uh, something that's commonly used in compute for AI. If it has a high need for compute, if my specific workload has a high need for compute, it will probably benefit by being run on a two processor server that supports high performance CPUs, either of higher frequency or more cores. And that's gonna be application dependent as well. That workload could also benefit from GPU acceleration. So that means a 2U box that would support more GPUs. That leads me to think of a DL380A or a DL385, since they will both support the four dual, double, ah, the four double wide GPUs uh, or the eight single wide GPUs. And that's up from three double wide GPUs in the Gen 10 plus DL380. So looking at positioning from another point of view, Let's step back a little bit and again, look at Gen 11, Gen 10, and Gen 10 Plus. So when it comes to high performance applications, things where we might wanna involve GPUs, analytics, AI, or any sort of performance oriented verticals like medical imaging, Gen 11 is definitely gonna be the best fit. That's gonna give us our best compute um, range of performance, if you will. Or things like, hybrid cloud environments or containers, 
Gen 11 is still a good fit, but the Gen 10 Plus might also be an excellent recommendation for areas where cost is a little bit of a concern. You don't necessarily need cutting edge, but I would like some performance, some decent performance. That's when you can continue to look at the Gen 10 Plus. And then for those smaller transactional environments or customers who are very price sensitive or even situations where rack power might be a concern, the Gen 10 or the possibly the Gen 10 Plus might be the best recommendations for that. Because remember, as we go up to the Gen 11, those newer, faster processors have more of a power draw. So if you're in, the, if your customer's in an environment where power is a concern, maybe those Gen 10 or Gen 10 Plus servers with their lower power draws might be attractive. So where do all these server families and generations fit relative to one another? So on this slide, uh, CPU resources are on the vertical axis. So increasing CPU resources, the higher it goes on the left. And expandability, which is storage, PCIe, GPU support, that's all on the horizontal axis. So the further to the right, the more storage, expandability, PCA slots, and or GPUs the server can support. And this is a relative positioning for each Gen 11, Gen 10 Plus, and Gen 10 server. Notice that in the far upper right, we have the DL580 and the Superdome Flex. Those are really the, the, the highest servers. They support four or more processors in the case of the Superdome Flex. Uh, and lots of storage in a 4U or 5U rack mount space. Conversely, lower left, the microserver Gen 10 Plus only supports a single processor, and it's not even a high-performing processor. Storage is pretty limited, and that's why it's low and to the left. If I just need something to share a few files, um, perfect for a small departmental work group or maybe my use in my home office, microserver might be great. If I need as much compute as I can possibly get, and I need a ton of PCIe expansion cards, I'm gonna be looking towards that upper right and looking at the Superdome Flex or the Superdome Flex 280. Uh, if I need to go above four PU, four, excuse me, if I need to go above four CPUs even, I could do that with the Superdome Flex and the Superdome Flex 280. Superdome Flex will give me the ability to go up to 32 processors, Superdome Flex will give me the ability to go up to eight. Or I'm sorry, the Superdome Flex 280 will give me the ability to go up to eight. The Superdome Flex gives me the ability to go up to 32 for those rare applications where I really need to build out my CPU. So here, we've overlaid the client servers with boxes approximating the server requirements for those general applications to demonstrate a reasonable sum set of ProLiant servers that best support those applications. So for VDI and containers, to the similarity of the workload requirements, um, private and hybrid cloud, data management, and compute for AI. The yellow stars all indicate where the new Gen 11s lie. But as I mentioned before, just because, for example, uh, the DL110 doesn't sit in the VDI box doesn't mean you can't do VDI on a DL110. You may find out, even though the DL110 isn't what you initially positioned for VDI, once you got your customer's actual workload, you said, you know what? A DL110 with its single processor will be fine for the small number of uh, virtual desktops they wish to deploy. And then kind of getting towards the end here and wrapping up, uh, I want to make sure everyone's aware of the BTO Server Acceleration Promo, which offers discounts of up to 20% on BTO servers built through iQuote. And this promo is going to be in place at least through the end of July. I'm also going to include two slides here at the very end, which just kind of go over Ingram Micro's pre-sales consulting and configuration services available via phone and via email. So you'll have that in the deck when I send it out. And that'll bring us to the end of today's presentation. So I hope that content was useful and it helps make it easier for you to position HP servers, any discussions you might have, as well as um, recommend them, recommend the correct server for your customer's workload. Uh, thanks to everybody for attending. If you wanna see more of these webinars, 
please fill out any surveys that find their way to you uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, and I'm going to check back in our Q&A box. We do have a note. Do we have end of life, end of support, end of support life, et cetera, on the Gen 10s? It would be nice to have an easy to locate central place for life cycle dates. Yes, we do, Donna. The best place to find that information, I would say right now, is OCA, uh, One Config Advanced. If you go into the partner portal and you pull up any of the uh, any HP product, you will get all those um, discontinuance, uh, obsolete, and support life dates in OCA. Um, you may have to, and if you don't see those when you click on BOM, BOM, Build of Materials, which gives you the list of parts, if you don't see all those dates left listed, if you go to the upper right in OCA and click on the little icon for your profile preferences, at the very bottom, you can turn on or off individual fields in your BOM display, and there will be buttons down there to turn on or off uh, end of life and end of support dates. So yes, you can definitely find that stuff. Uh, it is out there on the Gen 10s, uh, as well as the Gen 10 Plus and the Gen 11s, which you'll find those are like years out in the future. That looks like, I think that was the end of our questions. It was. Um, so thank you all again for your time. Um, and keep an eye out for those surveys and the presentation and a link to the recording. Thank you all for attending today.